methods, uh, how to analyze that data, and so on and so forth. But I thought maybe for the last class today, we'll speak a little bit more in terms of practical sort of on-ground um, value of such data and such research. And I thought uh, it'd be a great place for Dr. Patnagar to come and sort of speak to us about some of the experiences he's had over the last 20, 25 years of really doing both good science with the <clears throat> ungulates and, and snow leopards, but also applying that science for conservation and management. Um, so I'll start the class uh, by sort of just speaking a little bit about that. And then uh, Dr. Patnagar will take it from there. So I think we're about four minutes into the class. So I'll start. And, you know, if people trickle in, uh, Raki, please uh, uh, let them in. So great. I will just quickly share my screen. Super. I guess you guys can see my screen just to confirm. Yes. Super. Great. Okay. Uh, just give me a second. Lovely. So yes. Hi again, everyone. Um, we've made it to the last uh, class slash session of the second module uh, through the SLN, uh, which is all about sort of the play surveys and looking at <clears throat> really the, as we call them, the mountain monarchs of uh, High Asia. And again, as I um, see in every class, just to reiterate, you know, while I sit here and sort of talk to you about uh, this class, all of this module, including this, this session, really has been uh, possible with the amazing effort by all the people that are listed at the bottom here, you know, Hussein uh, from Snow Leopard Foundation Pakistan, uh, Puji and Chaksa, who's with us here again, from uh, Snow Leopard Conservation Foundation Mongolia, Ling Yun, uh, who uh, is at Chan Shui in China and myself uh, uh, sort of working uh, with Major Conservation Foundation, <clears throat> which is an NGO based here in India. So yeah, with that, we can start. And yes, be, uh, feel free guys to ask questions or you know, just sort of uh, open your uh, mics and speak up if you think uh, something is confusing or you know, if I'm going too fast or you don't understand something. And more importantly, you know, if uh, you disagree with something I say, because as I, uh, keep saying, you know, I'm by no means an expert in any of this. It's just sort of through readings and experience, uh, sharing a few of these things with everyone. So yeah, let's get started. So just for today, uh, the aim of the class is, you know, over the next maybe 20 to 30 minutes, I'll speak a little bit about how we can use uh, ungulate data or, you know, ungulate research for conservation and management. And I'll speak a little bit uh, sort of uh, towards um, use of such uh, information for conservation of predators, such as snow leopards, but also landscapes. So I'll speak a little bit more uh, theoretically, and here's a few examples. Uh, so hopefully what we, this will do is, um, you know, from class one to three, we sort of spoke about how to collect this data. So this sort of, you know, uh, will give us a flavor of how this can be used and applied. And then after that, more excitingly, uh, Dr. Bhattnagar will sort of share with us uh, some real life experiences of uh, ungulate conservation and management where a lot of different ungulate research and data uh, has been used uh, for different, uh, you know, conservation and management purposes, both in terms of, you know, it being applied and being successful, quote unquote, however we may define that, but, but also some of the challenges and some of key takeaways. So we're really, really excited uh, to have him with us. So that's what we'll uh, do today. And I hope, you know, today's class will not take us the entire two hours. So we'll see how we get along. So to start off, uh, what better way to do uh, start off than an activity? Uh, so if I can just ask people to just type uh, uh, in their chat box, uh, answers, potential answers to the following question. How do you think we can use ungulate data or research on ungulates? Uh, to do conservation and management, both of species, you know, ungulates themselves and landscapes. So what are potential ways to do that or, you know, examples uh, of uh, these, uh, these things? So just have a think about it. Uh, think about what we've learned in the first three classes as well. And if you can just type in the chat um, and then I can sort of uh, read out uh, what people think. Uh, yeah, what are some of the ways that they can be used. I think there's some answers in the chat already. OK. 
creating protected zones, Chloe, that's a, that's a great answer. Yes, that's a good one. Restricting access to cattle or, you know, in general, any sort of livestock, be it small or big. That's, that's a valid point. Obviously, that's a bit more protectionist uh, point of view where we sort of uh, keep, uh, let's say, the wildlife away from, from sort of human use. So that's, that's a good point. Other, other uh, thoughts or answers? Uh, anyone? How we can sort of use ungulate data for conservation and management, maybe of ungulates themselves or predators or landscapes? Oh, there's a lot of interesting answers coming in. So Nilofer says carrying capacity of a landscape. Interesting. So I guess Nilofer, if I'm correct, you mean uh, like how much uh, sort of how many species a landscape can can hold, if I uh, understand that correctly. Chloe says limiting hunting period. That's a very important point as well. You know, the more research we do, the more data we have from a place, we can see uh, how much and how long uh, hunting, legalized hunting can go on for because we spoke about how Hunting does make a very important uh, role in sort of ungulate conservation, especially in places in high Asia. Sunday says balancing ecosystem. As we all very well know, yes, uh, there's a great deal of interaction between predator and prey, so yes. Tashi says estimating carrying capacity, very similar to Nilofer, definitely. Reducing the pack per hunter, so similar point to sort of manage hunting areas better, Chloe, definitely a great answer. Uh, Luciano says identifying areas for possible eco, uh, eco restoration. Very good point because we can sort of understand what the value of those areas are. Ranjana says resource selection and priority zones. Very true as well. Uh, Arya says you can use eight sex structures, recruitment ratios, can provide valuable information about the population structure and sustainability of the population so that management decisions can be made. Super point. And we spoke a little bit about this obviously last time. So yes, uh, perfect. Daniel says developing, <clears throat> excuse me, conservation strategies, carnivores based on ungulate population. Exactly. Tashi says to see a particular landscape can support viable populations or not. Restoration of plant community, estimating biomass. So exactly. Thanks, thanks everyone. That's an amazing sort of diversity of answers. So we can already see that by just having ungulates in our uh, sort of research and understanding of landscape, there is a lot that we can sort of apply that research towards, be it for ungulates themselves or landscapes or other species. Oh, there's more, something more in the chat. Evaluation of conservation effort. It can be an index. Yeah, you know, if populations are going up or low. Super. So over the next few slides, everyone, I will just try and speak about a few ways we can use this data. By no means are these the only ways, but these are just some of the ways. So a lot of research uh, over the last two decades has shown that ungulates are key determinants of snow leopards. Uh, and while I say snow leopards, this is also true for many other predators, you know, beyond just the high mountains of Asia, be it common leopards in different parts of Asia and Africa, tigers within India, and so on and so forth. So this picture that you see is from the coast uh, mountains of Mongolia. This is where Chaksa does a lot of her field work, and she can tell you more about it. It's a beautiful landscape. As you can see, it's sort of a landscape where you have these small mountains sort of interspersed between areas of the steppe or sort of flat grassland deserts. Um, so I'm just gonna speak a little bit about uh, the research here. So a paper published by Johansen et al. Uh, back in 2015, uh, looked at 19 collared snow leopards. Um, so they collared about 19 individuals of snow leopards from this region in Mongolia. And uh, this system of the Coast Mountains is also a livestock dominated system. In other words, the, the number of livestock far outweigh the number of, uh, you know, just, uh, ungulate prey or other sort of wild species in these in this landscapes. And just to loop back a little bit to Chloe's point, uh, this is often the case with most um, storable landscapes. You know, we think of these areas as vast and remote and you know, sort of out there in the wilderness. And while that's true to a certain extent, very rarely do snow leopards find themselves living in places without humans. There is some sort of interaction uh, somewhere. Not always, but there's a high overlap. And those is one of those, one of those areas. So after coloring um, 19 snow leopards, uh, 
what Johansson et al. found was that snow leopards on average are killing one ungulate every eight days. So that's interesting, right? So you already can sort of roughly estimate that for one snow leopard to sort of survive throughout the year, they need to be killing about 50 to 60 ungulates. So that's for uh, their own consumption. And this is obviously with the caveat that you know, snow leopards might be eating other prey like marmots in the summer and so on and so forth. But that's already something uh, of value. But what's more interesting, and this is a point that I would really strike home, is what they find is that even in a livestock dominated system, I think in this system there was 10 times more livestock than, than one ungulate. Disproportionately upon the wild prey. So about 73% of their uh, diet came from wild prey, in this case, Ibex and Argali, and only 27% came from livestock. So what this already tells us is it's highly unlikely that a viable population of snow leopards can survive without wild prey being there. Or in other words, even if you have a lot of livestock in an area, I would assume and think at the back of these results and some of the other results that I speak about, it's highly unlikely that we find a good population of snow leopards without wild prey being there. So it's a very interesting finding. The other interesting uh, finding that they, they, they find is that male snow leopards killed larger prey and two to three times more livestock compared to females and youngs. So it's already a bit more value to the information we have uh, in the sense that, you know, um, for, for snow leopards to survive as a population, there will be these, uh, this important limiting factor, which is you need to have these larger, uh, and which generally means more older prey uh, species, you know, your, as we spoke last time, class three, class four males of, let's say, Ibex, or even Agali, though uh, it's harder for a snow leopard to, let's say, predate an Agali, but that's a different, uh, um, big Agali, but they do, of course. But you can already see that you need a healthy, sort of persistent population of prey to really be there. So yeah, so from this study, we realized that, yeah, ungulates are key determinants of snow leopards. But taking it forward, a study uh, from Surya Manshi in 2017, and I think uh, Dr. Bhattaka was part of this, showed that in fact, it's not only that they're uh, prey, they are key determinants of snow leopards, there, there is actually a linear relationship between the two. So basically what they did was, they worked across seven sites, in uh, Central and South Asia. Across these seven sites, they collected fecal uh, samples of snow leopards and conducted camera tracking in a few sites, and they sort of looked at the density of snow leopards. But they also looked at diet. And, you know, uh, they conducted double observer surveys across these uh, seven sites uh, in Central and South Asia. And what's fascinating is that they find this result, uh, and I'm sorry, I know the graph is a bit cluttered, but let me just walk everyone through it. On the x-axis, we had wild prey density, so just the number of, uh, sorry, the density of wild prey using exactly the methods we spoke about in class two, class three. Um, against, on the y-axis, we have snow leopard densities. And as you can see, that there is almost a linear relationship, or in other words, areas with higher wild prey will tend to have higher snow leopards. And that's exciting. So that already shows that as a manager or as a conservationist, if you want to start conserving snow leopards, you know, because they're umbrella species or they're a keystone species or what have you, you know, there's so many of these terms flying around, you can already see that you need to make sure that you conserve the prey, which is ideally uh, ungulates for snow leopards. Uh, and it's similar for tigers and some other predators. And this data really, really shows that. But there's an interesting piece to this story. Uh, you know, for a long time, researchers thought, okay, you know, if you increase wild prey, and as I said previously, you know, snow leopards are found in these landscapes where people <clears throat> live in close proximity to snow leopards. So they thought, you know, okay, <clears throat> what if you increase wild prey? Snow leopards will start eating wild prey. They won't eat livestock. And, you know, because snow leopards eating livestock is a big problem because not only does that cause a lot of economic and social sort of damage to the people who rear these livestock, but it also results in many times retaliatory killing of snow leopards. So there was this thought that said, increase wild prey means increase snow leopards and less uh, sort of impact on livestock. But this very study also showed, amongst other studies, of course, that interestingly what's happening in these landscapes is with increasing wild prey, right? There is a positive 
<clears throat> relationship with snow leopards as shown by this arrow, which in other words means snow leopards uh, numbers increase and obviously they're eating wild prey and hence the negative impact. But also in areas with a lot of snow leopards, they are also opportunistically feeding on livestock. Even though that percentage is very low, there is still some level of depredation. So just by increasing wild prey, you're not going to solve that uh, issue. So what we realized in time is for snow leopard conservation, not only do you need to increase wild prey, but snow leopard conservation efforts that are aimed at facilitating increase in wild prey must be accompanied by greater assistance for better livestock protection and offsetting the economic damage caused by uh, carnivores. So it's interesting because, and the reason why I share this example is because it sort of shows us that anything in isolation is probably not good. Just studying ungulates and sort of saying, okay, let's increase their numbers and everything will be fine, is not necessarily going to, uh, going to be good. So it's part of a multifaceted uh, uh, sort of ecological issue, but also conservation issue. The next quick example that uh, I want to share with people is about um, how we can understand carnivore numbers through prey numbers. In other words, you know, generally, uh, the ideal situation is if you go into a landscape, you say, okay, I'm going to do, let's say, camera trapping or fecal analysis to understand how many snow leopards are there in a landscape. Then I will do, let's say, double observer or whatever to understand how many prey there are in the landscape and so on and so forth. But logistically, sometimes that's just not possible. You know, we might not have enough human resource. We might not have enough um, uh, just financial resource. Uh, seasons are short, so on and so forth. But there is an interesting relationship between prey numbers and predator numbers. And again, this is just a very simple example. Uh, and feel free to uh, give me your thoughts about this or, you know, if there are other examples. So back in 2002, uh, there was a paper written by Carbon and Benjamin. Uh, where they sort of argue about this so-called energetic ratio. In other words, they said, suggest that across any landscape in the world, what will happen is, because of energetics, and I won't get too much uh, into that, about 10,000 kilograms of prey will support roughly 90 kilograms of predator. Right? I mean, if you think about the uh, you know, sort of the trophic pyramid that we sort of studied in our biology class. Obviously, when you go from one trophic level to the other, you know, there's a lot of loss in energy. So this is sort of, they did a lot of different simulations and looked at a lot of different ungulate, uh, sorry, prey and predator uh, biomass and numbers. And they sort of came up with this uh, ratio, as I said, yeah, 10,000 kg of prey to support about 90 kg of predator. So let me use this uh, case to give you, uh, sort of show you how we can use this, uh, you know, sort of towards conservation and management. Um, and I'll use this through an example of a, uh, of a study site that I was fortunate to work in, in Kyrgyzstan in Sanitla. In that area, uh, as for the predators, we have <clears throat> snow leopards, but we also have wolves in, those, in that area. In terms of prey, uh, or ungulate prey anyways, we have the Argali, which is the wild sheep, and we also have uh, Asiatic ibex or Siberian ibex, uh, which is down here, uh, which is a wild goat species. And I completely understand, you know, there are a lot more prey, especially for wolves, they play things like marmots and things like that, or even pika uh, for, to a certain level. But let's, for one, assume that, you know, the prey predator sort of interaction in this case study in the Kyrgyzstan Shan is the two predators and these two prey. So this is an example from Sarichat. Uh, at Tash Nisha Reserve, which is in the Tianshan. What we did was we conducted double observer surveys and we found that there's about 1,294 Argali, or actually it's the other way around, sorry, it's about 1,294 Ibex and 885 Argali in this landscape. So that was, you know, applying all the field methods that we learned in class one and class two and all the analytical methods we talked about in class three. Uh, but we had no clue about how many snow leopards are there, you know, because we couldn't do camera trapping or fecal analysis just because of logistical issues. And then we went back into literature and we sort of found out that, you know, a mean mass of an ibex is about 60 kgs. Obviously, this will vary depending on age sex classifications and, you know, we can be more accurate with those, but I'm just using this as an example. And then, you know, we did more literature search and realized a mean mass of an algali is about 90 kgs. 
again, huge variation between males and females, but if you average across sexes. And then mean mass of a snow leopard is about 40 kgs, and mean mass of a wolf is about uh, 30 kgs. Now, if you apply the carbon enrichment ratio, what we find is that there's about 1,000, uh, like 157,290 kilograms of prey. Uh, and I apologize because I know these are a lot of numbers, but what, essentially what we've done is we've multiplied uh, these numbers with the weights of the individual uh, prey to get an overall prey number, right? And we have no idea about predators, but using the ratio, which is 10,000 kg of prey is to 90 kg of predator, we find that, you know, just using simple math, there's about 1,014 uh, kilograms of predator. And if we back transform that using 40 kgs of uh, snow leopards and 30 kgs of wolf, we can already sort of say uh, there's about 20 individuals of wolves and snow leopards together in this landscape. Or in other words, uh, this landscape can potentially have, uh, you know, around 20 individuals. Whether they're actually there, obviously, is a factor of, you know, there might be exploitative uh, activities such as poaching <clears throat> or hunting that might not result in the, the predators actually being there. You know, even if they are there, doesn't necessarily mean the predator would be there. But I hope this example sort of shows how we can use prey numbers to get a sense of um, how many potential predators might be there in, uh, in a landscape. So yeah, and if people are not sure or confused about this, please feel free to type or speak uh, out. After this, I will just use, uh, give another quick example of how angular data can really be used for, again, for conservation of snow leopards and, and landscape. Uh, there's a comment in the chat, just quickly. Uh, sorry, uh, Stefan says, maybe put this uh, relation to kill rates and population size of ungulates. So Stefan, for the, for the, for the carbon and detriment ratio, uh, that uh, is not required because those are energetic ratios. So regardless of kill rates and population size of ungulates, that ratio is conserved because it's all to do with energetics. Uh, the previous examples that I uh, spoke about, uh, definitely those are, um, uh, th those are influenced by kill rates and population uh, sizes of uh, ungulates as well. So yeah, I, uh, yeah. I, I hope uh, that's clear. Uh, sorry, I just meant if you have 20 snow leopards mm -hmm. and they would have a kill rate of uh, one ungulate every eight days, roughly mm -hmm. 50, 50 per, uh, per snow leopard, you get a kill rate of 1,000 ungulates. If you have yes. a total population of uh, 2,200 ungulates in the area, that would be a killing over the year of 50%, yes. which mm -hmm. would probably not fit into any population model. So yes. the snow leopards so, would yeah. exterminate the ungulates within yes. a few years. And it has actually been observed with tar in mm -hmm. the Himalayas. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, I think there is uh, beyond the, the, K, the KGs and the energy the yes. rates, there is something mm -hmm. about the population to be considered. And yes. uh, so I would be a bit cautious about it because the numbers you showed before all this showed about one snow leopard mm -hmm. per 100 ungulates. Yes. I would, from a population perspective, uh, of the ungulate population find uh, mm -hmm. slightly unrealistic, which means oh, yeah. e either there mm -hmm. is an underestimate of the ungulate populations yes. or there is another nutrition source of the snow leopards. Exactly. It's, no, it's, no, exactly. It's, 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 it's in, a, in a range which is significant. So this we, yes. we should think about. It. Maybe it's just as a, a food for thought. Yes. Thank no, that's you. a very valid point, Steph. No, uh, thanks, thanks for articulating that. So what I should say, guys, especially for these ratios, carbon and vitamin, when I say 20 individuals, it's actually not uh, going to be 20 individuals of predators. So this is just to uh, say that potentially they can be there. Now, there are issues with um, uh, things like, yeah, as, as Stefan spoke about, but what you have to, uh, is with these ratios, they give you relative importance. So let's say if I was... Um, Looking at uh, Saricha at uh, uh, Nature Reserve with these uh, numbers, with let's say you know Pin Valley, which is an in, uh, which is a landscape in India, we'll, we'll have different numbers. So we might have you know like about ten individuals of snow leopards being there. So these ratios are not actually transferable to to real life to say that you know there will be ten leopards, snow leopards on 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 land, but. In the relative sense between Pin and Sarichat, you can sort of say there should be more in Sarichat than Pin. But yeah, I completely agree that there are those uh, 
issues. And one more point, uh, Atashi, I'll just uh, get your point as well. <clears throat> and one more point is, yes, so previous one, uh, Stefan, you correctly said, the densities of ungulates are generally ungulates uh, per square kilometer, whereas densities of snow leopards are generally uh, number of individuals per um, uh, 100 square kilometers. So you just have to be careful uh, how we interpret those. So Tashi says, maybe also consider livestock into this calculation if there are any in the area. Exactly, Tashi. So the, that's a very good point as well. Obviously, we'll have to uh, uh, have a, we'll have to sort of weight it by the, how much the uh, livestock contribute uh, to the snow leopards. So I think uh, what is more, uh, <clears throat> what is more uh, sort of uh, useful, I think, rather than these energetic ratios is the, the previous example I showed, you know, this, this one. Uh, this back. Uh, yeah, so sort of the linear uh, relationship, I think here it will be more informative to sort of uh, uh, incorporate uh, that into sort of, you know, the wild prey density, but weight it by uh, the proportion. So for instance, as we know from Johansson et al, we can weight the wild prey densities by 0.73, because, you know, we know from Mongolia, you know, there's about 73% is consumed by solar, but then, you know, the rest 27%, we can weight the livestock numbers. But I completely concede, you know, that that might be different from different areas. And it's by no means one fit all um, uh, sort of uh, strategy, but hopefully this gives some food for thought for, you know, uh, how managers can sort of assess very quickly uh, potential and relative uh, numbers, not actual numbers, but relative numbers uh, across places. So the last example before uh, another sort of speaks to us. Um, there's someone more point in the chat. I'll just have a look. Sorry, guys. Uh, our aim is close to zero for the livestock. Yes, uh, hopefully there will be no killing and there will be enough uh, wild prey uh, for some effort. Yes, I completely agree, Stefan. The other very important um, uh, sort of management and conservation impact that ungulates can have, again, for snow leopards, and I'm, I'm talking a little bit more snow leopards and landscape, is potential impact through, you know, well-managed trophy hunting sites. And Stefan, uh, I'm sure, can speak more about this than I can, but I'll just use an example of a study that I read and I thought was interesting uh, to just illustrate this point. So the study from the Tajik Amirs by Shannon Kachel and his colleagues back from 2016, what they basically do is a two-site comparison. And I know, obviously, two sites are not necessarily representative, but of, you know, the larger uh, area or larger sort of, uh, uh, sort of, you know, characteristics of hunting or no hunting, but this just gives us some indication. These are in the Tajik Pamirs, as you can see from here. One, I think Murgat is a, is a well-managed uh, trophy hunting site, and very close to it is Mandian, which is a sort of unmanaged uh, natural area where apparently, the, the authors quote that there is a lot of uh, potential hunting and sort of uh, retaliatory killing of, of snow leopards. So what uh, uh, Kachel et al. did was they went to both Mandian and Murka, looked at ungulate numbers through, I think they used distance sampling actually, uh, if I'm not mistaken, but I can have a look. But they sort of estimated ungulate densities and they did a bit of camera tapping. Uh, no, I think they did fecal analysis uh, to look at snow leopard numbers. And interestingly, what they find is that in the well-managed trophy hunting site, the relative density of snow leopards and wild prey were actually more uh, in those well-managed trophy hunting areas. And it's interesting because there, the people actually were managing uh, the number of wild prey, uh, as Chloe said in uh, one of her points that, you know, you can use uh, data from, let's say, double observer surveys or any robust ungulate surveys to get a, the, a number of, you know, how many, uh, Head you can sort of uh, sort of offtake from from a, from a place, and Murgab is a good example of that. So you know, there's, they were really concentrating on those uh, numbers of wild prey, and not only were they good, coincidentally, the relative uh, densities of snow leopard was good as well. And the authors argue that other factors such as habitat between these two areas are not really different. Uh, so that's interesting. And uh, also, uh, sort of looping back to Tashi and Stefan's point, you know. While ungulates in the managed trophy hunting site also accounted for a greater proportion of prey, even though there was a bit of livestock, I think, in these areas. So you can already see that managing ungulate populations after studying them is not only good for predators such as snow leopards, but it's also great uh, potentially alongside when you have those mitigating strategies to reduce economic and social costs uh, 
on on people and you know with an added benefit of let's say well managed trophy hunting uh, you know you can get a lot of social capital into these areas and i'm not saying and trophy hunting is such a such a controversial topic and i'm not saying for or against it all i'm saying is you know this is what we know from our, from these areas so i'm just sort of sharing this with everyone so just to wrap up um, quickly as you can see through these examples there's a lot of different diverse ways uh, to use ungulate data really uh, towards conservation and management both of ungulates but also for landscapes and species so i'll just stop sharing my screen here